Yeah, we're doing it after church, after I preach. We are uh, always changing the dean department, make it more fun, make it uh, more exciting. We're doing a new teen gift shop now where we're giving out teen bucks, amen. And uh, depending on what they do, if they memorize their verse, dress up for church, bring a Bible, bring a friend, they get teen bucks and they can save it up or spend it on anything from a bicycle to a computer to a TV. So granted, it will take them a while to earn that TV, amen. <laughs> so, some of them are like, man, I'm going to get this in two weeks. I'm like, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> hey, I ain't that rich, amen. So uh, all right. Well, grab your Bibles again. Go to Hebrews, Hebrews 10 in your Bible, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 in your Bible. Been a good service so far. And hope you're excited like I am to be in God's house. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to get up, it's hard to be here, but once you're here, hopefully you're just like, man, I, I belong here. It is where I'm supposed to be, amen. And you can never go wrong uh, being faithful to the Lord. Well, let's look at Hebrews 10. I love the first, we're going to actually, what I read to you this morning wasn't even the message really. I am going to talk about it, but really I'm focusing on the later part of the chapter, which is the, the, and the title of the message, Brother Roush, is Led Us. I forgot to tell him the title of the message for Wednesday, so he put something in there, amen. Um, so I want to tell you this time, Let Us, and it actually looks on the three Let Us that Paul says. We believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and it's down there in 22 through 24, is where the main focus of the message is going to be at. But let's look at chapter 10, verse 1. Let's pray real fast. Lord, we love you. We thank for you. I pray, God, that you'll just bless the service now. Bless the message. Lord, I pray you just put your power upon me, dear God. Uh, Lord, I, I, without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I cannot say anything that would mean anything, God. So I pray, Lord, you just come in. You'll take over. And, Lord, you'll give something to everyone. Lord, you know exactly what everyone needs, and I pray you'll give it to them. And, uh, God, we love you. Thank for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> We're going to do a lot of script reading today, so I hope you brought your Bible, Bible underneath if you don't have one, underneath the chair. Chapter 10, verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto what church? Perfect, so it's not a final solution. It will never, never will be, just like your works would never be a solution to get to heaven as well. Verse two, for then would they have not ceased to be offered. If it was a final solution, then why did they have to keep offering sacrifices? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offering and sacrifice for sin that thou hast made no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the what church? And why do we have the law? Go to, uh, go to Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24. This actually popped up in my head during the special music. Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24, why was the law there? It, it, it helped us. It taught us something. Galatians 3.24, <clears throat> Galatians 3.24, look at this right now. Read with me. Wherefore, the law was our what church? Schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. To bring us unto who? Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law pretty much taught us, just like it taught the Israelites, that we could never keep it, amen? That we can never keep everything that God has us to do in the Bible. It's impossible. If you're a sinner in here, say amen. 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 If you told a lie, you're a sinner, bless God. And that's what the law was there to teach us. It was to teach us that we are imperfect and that there's no way we can be perfect and that we needed something besides human, uh, uh, human sacrificing animals to get to heaven. And I love that part right there. So number one about this first section of chapter 10 of verses one through eight is the law. Verses 9 through 14, I'm thankful for the Savior, amen. I'm thankful that we didn't have, hey, I'm thankful I don't have to take one of my, uh, go get some lambs, Miss Karen, and sacrifice a, la a lamb once a year to try to atone for my sins. I'm thankful Jesus, the perfect lamb, came and died on the cross for us, so I never need to do that. Looks at it right here, verse 9 then. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. You know, so many people struggle with doing the will of God. I'm thankful Jesus didn't struggle with that, amen. I'm thankful that he 
not my will, but what? Thine be done, amen. I'm thankful for that right there. And you look at this right here, thy will. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. But the which, by the which will we are sanctified, made clean, made holy, separated through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11, and every priest standing daily, again, talking about man ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, I love that part, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, use a circle rat right there, this man, one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, and uh, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And what's that referring to, church? That's talking about the rapture, amen. That's talking about when he comes again with us and defeats the enemies of God. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And there's three parts of this. The Savior, letter A, his obedience. Go to Matthew 26. We already talked a little bit about this, but I love reading this part. Matthew 26. (laughs) It's pretty sad how hard it is for Christians to live like Christians, to obey the simple commands of God right here. When Jesus went, Jesus, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know by serving Jesus what will happen tomorrow, but God knew exactly, the Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what was going to happen when he decided, not my will, but thine be done. When he gave himself on that cross, he knew all the pain and suffering he was going to face. He knew all the persecution he was going to face by mankind, the spit that was going to be put on him, the beard that was going to be plucked out, the cross that he was going to be nailed to, the people that would mock him and attack him and say, if thou art the Christ, take thyself down. He knew everything of that. And what did he say? Look at Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Uh, Then cometh Jesus with him into a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, his closest confidants on earth, who he'd been telling time and time again, I'm gonna die soon, I'm gonna die soon. And But they didn't understand. Can you imagine that, having, having the face this alone because that's what he was doing. He's really facing this alone right here. And look at verse 38. Then saith he unto them, my soul is what? Exceeding sorrowful, even unto what church? Even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He needed some encouragement. He needed some uplifting. And look at verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed and saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as that what? Thou wilt. And he cometh into disciples and findeth them what? Asleep. I'm thankful for a savior that was obedient, amen. Thankful that of her savior that was obedient. Unlike us so many times, Christ, when he was told to die on that cross for us, he obeyed. He obeyed. And he didn't need and he didn't have any help with that. He didn't have any friends that come and lifted him up. They fell asleep on him twice. And yet he still went. He sacrificed himself. B. So letter A, his his obedience. B, his perfect sacrifice. Go to uh, um, go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. His perfect sacrifice. I love how Paul, this portion right here, Paul is breaking down the law about why the law was there, about the Savior who came to save us, and also about uh, the comforter as well and the boldness that we can have through all this right here. So it be his perfect sacrifice. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 11 through 14. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his what church? Own blood. He entered into what? Once unto the holy place, having et- obtained temporary eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean unclean sanctify to the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? And it is. It is able to completely wash away all of our sins. His obedience, his perfect sacrifice. And guess what? The Bible says he was tempted like any other man while on earth tempted. Do you think, you don't think the devil was working him over time? The devil knew if Jesus was defeated, mankind was doomed. And what did he do? He still stood strong. His perfect sacrifice, his obedience, his perfect sacrifice, and see his current position. I'm thankful that after three days, he rose again, amen. And that he's not still in the grave, but he's on the right hand of the Father. He's on the right hand of the Father. Go back to uh, waiting to come get his bride and waiting to defeat his enemies. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Just keep your place in Hebrews 11, amen. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 51 through 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be what churched. I'm thankful that we're going to leave these old tired bodies, man, with all their problems, all their issues. It's all going to be left alone. I'm thinking of a Ron Pop, Miss Carol, who's got a perfect body now in heaven. Hey, he left that old tired body behind. The same is going to be said for us. But Joe, that shoulder is going to be made new, amen. Brother Jeff, that throat, it's, hey, it's some good things going to be happening in heaven. You struggle with cancer. I'm thankful that we're never going to have to deal with that again when we're in heaven. That's the promise. That's what Jesus did for us. Why is it too much to ask what Jesus asked of us in the Bible? Look at this right here. In a moment, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I don't think I'd want to live forever on earth, but I'm excited to live in forever in heaven. Amen. Thankful for that right there. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought the past the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I'm thankful Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. Verse 56, the, sin, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is a law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our who? Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful it says our, amen. If you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, say amen. He belongs to you. I belong to him, and he is yours, and you can claim that victory that he's given us. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Church, it may be hard on earth, but I'm thankful that someday we're going to go to heaven, we're going to have a new body, we're going to be immortal, and we're going to be right by Jesus, and all that labor we did for him on earth, it's going to be worth it all. And we're actually going to look back and say, man, I wish I had given him more, like that song says. So don't quit. Don't stop giving to God. Amen. Don't stop serving him. Verse 15. Look at verse 15 now. Go back to Hebrews 11. So we talked about the law and how it was our schoolmaster and we needed a savior. And now we're talking about the comforter, the comforter. Uh, he, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 15 now, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 10. I'm sorry. Hebrews 10 verse 15. Look at this. Wherefore the, whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us for after that, he had said before, and go to, uh, go to John 16, go to John 16. So after Jesus died and he went up to heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of God, he didn't leave us alone, amen, he left us a comforter. John 16, John 16 in your Bible, John 16. John 16 in your Bible, look at verse, uh, John 16, look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will approve the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of the world is judged. Of judgment, uh, because the prince of the world is judged. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but she cannot bear them now. Verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all what church? For he shall speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show unto you all the things that the Father are mine, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a, a little while, and ye what? Shall see me, because I go to the Father. And go to Romans 8. Go to Ro actually, go to Romans or, yeah, go to Romans 8, verse 6. And I'm going to read verse 33 real quick. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the what, church? The world. The world. I'm thankful that we're on the winning side. And God, the devil might uh, win some battles in your life, but God's won the war, amen. It will be all over soon. Look at this right here. Uh, Romans 8, Romans 8, verse 6. Romans 8, verse 6. No, that's not right. Verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the what, church? Children of God. The children of God. Hopefully the Spirit tells you that you're his child. Hopefully that's the case. The children of God. So we got uh, the law, the Savior, the Comforter, and let, lastly, look at this right here, of this portion right here, and then we'll go into the let us. Go to back to Hebrews, 11, uh, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10.
the Lord. I will put my law, laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them. And, and their iniquities will I remember no more. But I like this part. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds while I write them. You know, something should have changed when you got saved, amen. The Holy Spirit moved in. There should have been some conviction when you sinned as well because God, God puts his Holy Spirit in there and God gives you understanding of his word and God gives you direction with what you should, how the way you should be living as well. And you look at this right here in verse 19. We're gonna uh, go to verse 19 there. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And I put right there a presence of God. And I'm thankful I can go into his presence. I can go boldly because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Boldness speaks of confidence. Why can I have confidence? Because of 14 and 17. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And verse 17, in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The beginning of chapter 10 breaks down the hopelessness and ineffectiveness of man's sacrifices. And the Savior who solved the problem with one sacrifice. Verses 22 through 24 speaks directly to the child of God who has accepted the perfect sacrifice. The author of Hebrews, which many believe to be Paul, exhorted the believer to do three things. And we're going to look at that now. Three things. Look with me now. Point number one. Look at verse 22. Let us what? Draw near. Draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of what? Faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil what, church? and our bodies washed with pure water. Go to Psalm 73, 28. Psalm 73, 28. Psalm 78, 73, 28. But it is good for me to what? Draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. But it is good for me to draw near to God. Go to, go to James 4, 8 now. James 4, 8. James 4, 8. Let us draw near to God. Church, how close are you, God? How, how close are you to God right now? I'm a long way off, preacher. Well, that can change so easily. God's, God, hey, God didn't go anywhere. You did. And God wants, hey, God wants, God says, if you draw nigh to me, I'll what? Draw nigh to, me. Draw nigh to you. James 4, 8 promises that right there. Kind of just gave my, my verse away. James, James 4, verse 8. I love verse 7 too. Submit yourselves therefore to who? Resist the devil and he will what? Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to you. But first, to be able to draw nigh to God, what, what do we need to do? We need to cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Sin and God don't mix, and it never will. You want to feel like a lost person? Live in sin, because you will have no relationship with God at all. No relationship. A relationship with God can never happen when sin is allowed control in the, the Christian's life. I'm going to go to Psalm 66. You just listen. Psalm 66, verse 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Regard iniquity in my heart. And then Romans 6. Go to Romans 6. Drawing nigh to God. What does it take to draw nigh to God? It takes some commitment to stay away from sin, to repent of the sin that's in my life. It also takes some actions as well of uh, reading my Bible, praying, and again, getting that sin out of my life. Romans, uh, Romans 6, verse 11. Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, what? In your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of what? unto sin, but yield yourselves unto who? As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What? God forbid. It's so sad to see so many people, well, I'm on my way to heaven now, so I, you know, if I sin, it's not really gonna affect anything. You're still gonna give account for the way we live. We really are. We're gonna give an account. 
why would you not want a relationship with God? That'd be like, I mean, I, I don't know how your family lives are, but whenever I've gotten to a bad relationship with my father or mother, it bothers me horrendously. I don't know if you had a bad relationship with your kid at one time or your spouse, but it, it's horrible. Yeah. It really is. And, there is. and if it doesn't bother you, there's something seriously wrong if you enjoy not. There should be the same with our Heavenly Father as well, that when their relationship's not there, it should really bother us. And it's not gonna be there if there's sin in our life if there's things that we're willfully disobeying God about, whether it be our walk with him, whether it be what we watch, what we listen to, uh, whether it be uh, in the church house or not. I mean, this is all in the Bible. This is all in God's word. If we're, not, if we're willfully disobeying it, how can we have a relationship with the Lord? Because God said you can't. Is he a liar? No, he's not. Draw nigh to God, and I'm thankful he'll draw nigh to us. Second Corinthians, go to, um, go to 2 Corinthians 6 now. 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 14. But, uh, and again, I, I know some of this is just very familiar. But I, again, I, you can't go over this stuff enough. Right. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord, what fellowship, what communion hath Christ with who? The, the devil. That's another word for the devil, church. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the who? As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And how can we continue to live in sin when we have a living God inside us? How can we be okay with that? How can we be okay with not having a relationship with our Heavenly Father? Yeah, he lives inside us, but is there any relationship there? Wherefore, come out from among them and be what? saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, for I will receive you. So many times we accept the hand offered to us by God out of the pig pen in the filth of this world, only to jump right back in, only to jump right back in. I'm thankful like the prodigal son, though, that the Lord is always waiting for us when we come out and wake, wake, up, out of our, wake up out of that mess, and he's waiting there right, on, right where we left him. Amen. Ephesians 5.11, you don't have to go there, I'll turn there real quickly. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them. Hmm. Go to Acts 9. Acts 9. <coughs> draw nigh to God. Let us draw. Paul said, let us, church, draw nigh to God. It's a continual process too. It's not something that you can do in a day. It's not something, I mean, it's, you know, I, I kind of thought about this illustration here. It's like a boat and it's like it's got holes in it and you constantly have to do what? Keep, yeah, keep bailing out the water, amen, or shoveling. I don't know how a shovel works very well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. But exactly, bail, uh, bail it out, scoop it out. But it, it takes work, right? If you want that, the boat to stay afloat and keep going, you got to keep bailing out the water, amen? And that's kind of like our relationship with God as well. If we want it to keep moving forward, we got to keep putting work into it. Because if you just let the water keep coming in, eventually what's going to happen? Or whatever that noise is, sink. <laughs> and, uh, but church, draw nigh to God. And, and, and if you're not in that active process right now, Why? Why aren't you drawing nigh to God? Is it because of sin? And we all know sin that we struggle with. But look at this right here, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Look at Acts 9. I like, I like this about Acts 9. I don't understand people that get saved and Lord's done a work in me, and they go right back into the pig pen they came out of. Why? Why, why is that? You look through the Bible. When God, when God healed someone, when God changed someone's life, what happened? They were changed. You saw change, right? You saw action from that. You saw God healing people. And you, didn't see, you didn't see them. Look at this right here. Look, up, look, up, look at uh, chapter 9. Look at Acts 9. Uh, look at verse 1. one. And, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, talking about Christians, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, Lord, what will thou have me to do? 
do. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the city, and thou shalt be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Look at verse 17 now. And uh, Ananias, who the Lord had come to Paul to heal him of his blindness, and Ananias went into his way and entered unto the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest have sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when, he, and, and when he had received me, he was strengthened. Then was Paul certain days of the disciples, which were at Damascus. So look at that first part. Saul was with who then? The disciples. He had a desire to be around the people of God. He had a desire. And w- what about you, church? Do you have a desire to be around the people of God? Paul didn't go and be like, all right, I'll see you guys. Good to see. I'm going to go hang out with my friends that were murdering Christians with me. I, you know, he didn't see that right there. He immediately started fellowshipping with the disciples for many days. Now look at this right here. And straightway, verse 20, man, the man had barely been saved, had hardly any knowledge of what who Jesus really was, just started becoming a Christian. What was he doing? And straightway, he what? preached Christ in the synagogues, he went right to the place that gave him command to kill the Christians. He went right directly to the place that had given him orders, kill all the Christians. And he started doing what? Preaching Christ. There was a change in his life. There was a desire to be different, to, to, to be something else in what he was before. He saw the pig pen and church, when you got saved, hopefully you realize that sin, that mess that I came out of, hey, that's sending me to hell. I want to go where there's not that. I want to be in with, with the body of believers. I want to be serving Jesus because that's, that's where I'm going to be a winner at. And look at this. Paul, after his conversion, became a changed man inside and out as well. He didn't return back to his old lifestyle after his conversion, but instead preached Jesus. Ephesians 5.11. Ephesians 5.11. I'm going to read that, and if you can get there if you want, or just wait until I do. Ephesians 5.11 Oh yeah, and I already talked about this. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That will, that will shorten up your friend list real quick if you're reproving sin, amen. Let me tell you that right there. And if you're quiet about sin, it's probably because you're partaking in it. But if you're reproving sin, that will shorten up your, your, your friend list real fast, amen. And uh, you say something about the Lord and about the wickedness of, of homosexuality or anything else on Facebook, you'll get some angry responses and some unfriend list real quick. Uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uncle, Ed Schweitzer, posted something uh, on, on Facebook talking about how can a Christian listen to that Super Bowl, uh, uh, Super Bowl halftime show and uh, claim they're right with God. And it was, it was a wicked show led by wicked people. And you would not believe the attacks he got from carnal Christians and lost people. But guess what? He saw some friends quickly leave him right there. Hey, when's the last time that you reprove sin? Because that's what we're supposed to do, church. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And when you draw nigh to God, that means you're shedding sin. You're shedding bad influences. You're shedding all those things that keep you from being close to God, church. Look at this right here. Uh, A Christian replaced the bad things with the good. Replace the bad things with the good. If you got a Friday night where you have a drinking problem or you have a television problem, hey, come to church and have a prayer prayer problem, amen? There's prayer meeting on Friday night just for you, amen? They keep you out of a sinful uh, time, time. Hey, Saturday, hey, instead of going and just sitting in the couch and watching TV, come out soul winning with us, amen? Or come to church and say, preacher, what can I do around here? Hey, there's so much to do. And if you want to live a changed life and you want to get rid of the bad stuff, you got to fill it with good stuff, amen? Because if you just leave it empty, you're going to be right back in that bat again. You're going to be right back. That's just like if you, I'm going to, I'm going to be in a diet this year. I'm going to be a diet this year. And uh, we all been there. Me. Amen. But we're, we'd be, uh, I'm going to be on a diet this year. But then the wife goes shopping and buys the same exact things, or you don't get anything. Um, you know, oh, we're not eating this. I'm not eating that. I mean, that. by three days into your diet, you're going to be going to the store, filling up your grocery, uh, your, your list with the food that you were eating before. You got, you got to start getting vegetables and fruit and gluten-free. Dear God, I'm just, you know, getting older just is rough, amen. You know, it just, you just can't eat what you used to. I used to just cug down a, a two liter of soda. It wouldn't bother me a bit. Now it's like, Ugh. so. It's, uh, but anyway, fill the, uh, take out the bad, fill it with good stuff. Fill it with good stuff. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Don't you want to be close to your savior? Just like you want to be close to your kids and close to your parents and close to those that you love. Do you love God? 
Why would we not want to be close to him? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. It's a promise and he wants it. He wants it so bad. I remember as a kid and I would do wrong and, dad, and the relationship was hurt. And dad would just wait for me to come in and apologize to him. Did he want to not talk to me? If I said something hurtful or nasty to him, especially as a teenager, teenagers are very nice sometimes with their words. And uh, I remember just how heartbroken he is when I would break that relationship. But how happy he was when I came back and I got right with him. And the same can be said about our Heavenly Father as well. He is desperate to be close to you. But what, are you, what effort are you making to be close to him? Aren't you tired of feeling like a lost person? Because that, and I tell you what, I've been, I've been, in, I've, I've got, I've got, we've all gotten away from God. We've all slipped away. Got, got just, just got out of our Bible, got out of praying, got, started watching the wrong kind of things, started listening to the wrong kind of things, got out of this church house. And you start feeling like a lost person. You really do. And you start just, it, it is, you just lose that, you lose that connection with God. And you start losing that, that connection with the Holy Spirit who prods and works in us. And I, I don't know about you, but I hate that. I hated it. I hate it every time it happens. Look at David too, a man after God's own heart. When David's relationship with God was broken, he was, he t- I'm on my couch with tears. I, I soak my couch with tears. He, the man was heartbroken over it. What about you, Christian? When you're not close to God, does it break your heart as well? And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, that's a really bad warning sign right there. If you can live like a lost person and it doesn't affect you at all, there's a question about your salvation right there. Because it should. Just like I know my dad, when me and my dad don't have a tight relationship and there's something wrong, it's because he's my dad, amen? He's not some complete stranger I met on the road. Oh, I'm not talking to him. It doesn't matter. No, he's my father. The same goes with our heavenly father as well. Draw nigh to God. Christian, replace the bad things with the good. The one thing you will need to do the most, the one thing you will need to do most of all to defeat the devil and sin when we are constantly tempted is prayer. Prayer. You need need the children of God's prayer and you need to be in prayer as well. Hey, uh, hey church, this, this church house is, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, so I'm gonna, but this church house is a prayer house, amen? It is not only for, you, you know, uh, me to pray for just my needs, but me to pray for Brother Joe's needs and Brother Mario's needs and Kristen's needs, especially her needs. She needs help, amen? I'm, <laughs> I'm getting a burnt meal tonight, amen? All right, <laughs> Listen, listen, but this church house is a prayer house, and it's a prayer house for all of us here at Solid Rock Baptist Church to pray for one another. Look at this right here. Um, go, go, to, go, to, go to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Why are we supposed to be in our Bible? Our, the Bible is full of stories of people that are going through the same struggles that, we went, uh, that we're going through. They went through the same struggles. They failed. They messed up. They, got, they, just, they fought hard against sin. And they needed the same stuff that we need as well. And look at Psalms 19. Look at Psalms 19 right here. Why do you think I love Peter and David so much? It's because they, they failed like I fail. But they didn't stay on the ground after they got knocked down. They got back up. But look at this right here, Psalms 19. David, why do I love the book of Psalms? Because I can relate so much to it. Psalms 19. Now, when he talks about what he wants to do to his enemies, I don't quite, you know, sometimes, most part, I don't really, I'm like, man, that is really tight. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rough right there, David. But, you know, when it comes to this right here about Psalms 19, verse 13, keep back thy, what, servant. Church, if you're a servant of God, say Amen. That means I do what he tells me to do. And he told me to do right here, this book right here. Keep back thy servant also from what? Presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. We all got some presumptuous sins that are constantly fighting to have dominance over us. That the devil knows that are, the, devil, the devil knows you inside out. He, he, he studies you all the time. Roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He studies you. And David here is praying, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion dominion over me. When's the last time you prayed that? You want a relationship with God, you got to get victory over the sin in your life. You want to draw nigh to God? Get victory over the sin. Get victory over the sin. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And church, you can't get victory over sin on your own. You need the Lord. Prayer prayer, prayer. Not only prayer from you, but also prayer from God's people as well. We, we're here to pray for each other, amen. All right, let's go to, um, all right, point number two. Point number two. That was a long point, church. We're almost done, amen, all right? Point number two. Point number two. Let us hold fast the what? Profession of our faith. Go to chapter uh, 10. Chapter 10. <coughs> Psalms 
So verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So in order to draw near, like it said right there, we have to have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. We have to be clean from sin to draw near. Number, verse 23, and when we draw near and we get close to God and we have a relationship with God and, and we're living for God inwardly and outwardly, 23, let us what? Hold fast the profession of our what? Without what, church? Because he's faithful that promised. Let us hold fast. The profession part of this verse speaks of the declaring of our faith or our testimony as a Christian. Professing, declaring, Hey, declaring that we are a Christian, our testimony is a Christian, a Christian that we express by words and actions. Now, brother, um, brother, uh, Pastor Pinson gave an illustration. I liked it so much. So, uh, brother Jeff's over here, and uh, he's gonna hold fast. Amen. That's his. Uh, what is it? What did I say? Faith. Amen. That's his testimony right there. And the old devil's gonna try to come, and your uh, old friends are gonna come, and they're gonna try to pull. I ain't gonna try to wrestle with you, brother. You'll probably send me flying. All right. <laughs> but he, uh, you know, I'm gonna pull. He's gonna pull. He, what does he gotta do? He's gotta hold fast, church. He's got to hold fast. And the devil, the devil will pull hard. The devil will try to knock you off your, uh, off, off that rock you build on, that testimony you have. He'll try to shut you up. And that's exactly what the devil's going to keep on doing. Let us hold fast. Look at this right here. Uh, Revelation 3.11. Look at Revelation 3.11. Revelation 3.11. So not only should we uh, let us draw near to God, but when we draw near and we have that testimony and we have a relationship with the Lord, uh, hold fast to it. Don't be movable. Uh, Revelation 3.11. Revelation 3.11. Behold, I what? And when he comes quickly, I want, to be, I want to be found holding fast to the faith, amen. Unmovable, my testimony, standing strongly for him. And uh, this right here, uh, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which thou what, church? That no man take thy what? I'm doing it for judgment day, <laughs> I'm doing it because someday I'm going to stand before Jesus with his pierced hands and feet and the, 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 the head that was crowned with a crown of thorns. And I'm going to stand there and give account of my life and how I lived it from salvation onward. Church, I want to be able to say it with a clear conscience and with to be able to, I, I, I've given him all I have. Look at Paul. I don't want to be anywhere near Paul because that man gave it all. And we are too as well. Hold fast. So many Christians aren't holding fast. They have let go of their separation and testimony and have slipped back into the world. They've let the devil get a victory over them. They let, let the devil pull them out of the fight. Hebrews 4.14, go there. Hebrews 4.14. Hebrews 4.14. <laughs> Verse 14. Chapter four, you there? Say amen. amen. Seeing then that we have a great what? I, I'm, I'm glad he's the only high priest I need, amen. I don't need to go to church and ask pastor to forgive my sins, go hide in a little booth and tell him all my evil deeds when he's probably doing worse than I am, amen. Not our pastor, I'm thinking more of like, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right, delete that. <laughs> uh, our pastor is just as close to perfect as you can get on this earth, all right? There we go. Um, listen, listen though, right here, I'm thankful we have a high priest that is passed under the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast what? Our profession. Our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points what? Yet without sin. So we got a God we can rely on. We got a God we can turn to. We have a Savior that knows exactly what we're going through because he went through it. Verse 16, so because he went through it, because he has all the power in the world and he's our high priest, verse 16, let us therefore come, what? Boldly. Unto the throne. And I'm thankful after salvation I can come boldly to the throne of grace, amen. Yes. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of what? Yes. You're living on earth, say amen. amen. Uh, you're, you're, you're in need all the time. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We need all the time. Church, hold fast, stand strong. Stand strong for your Lord. It says, it says over uh, a later passage too, I can't remember the reference, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not ashamed. 
How can we hold fast without first being nigh to God? And to be nigh to God, we must be free of unrepented sin. You cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the church or one foot with God. It just doesn't work. You can't, go to Matthew 6, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Uh, Go to 19. Look at 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. And this is extra stuff, but I'm just going to read it. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Meaning, the stuff on earth, it rusts, it rots, it gets old. That money in your account, hey, guess what? All that savings you have is losing value by the day. <laughs> Thank you, government. All right, amen. And, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 K bought you a lot more things 20 years ago. And not anymore, bless God. You know, gas, everything's going up. I mean, Lord Almighty, I'm trying to build another chicken coop, or turkey coop, I call it. And, and when I bought two, when we first started buying two by fours, like six years ago, it was like 250. And then when I bought my, built my first chicken coop, I about had a heart attack because it was like $6.50. Church, I looked at it now, it's like $13 now. I mean, so guess what? What we have on earth, it doesn't last long. It's not worth much. But I'm thankful that God gave us a 401k plan in heaven, amen, and that it, it's going to gain value, amen, and uh, not lose it. And you, don't have to wor- and you don't have to worry about, you know, the markets up in heaven going uh, crazy and... Uh, the market's going crazy in heaven and stuff like that, and it losing value. So, hey, build your treasure on uh, heaven. It's a lot more worth it right there. For where your treasure is, verse 21, there will your heart be also. And then look at, uh, look at verse 24. Look at verse 24. And this is so powerful right here. This is a true statement. No man can serve what? For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the God and you can't serve your savior and, and serve, you know, your uh, paycheck or whatever it is. You're, it is so sad. And, you know, I'm guilty of this too at times like that, how faithful we are to a job. We're more faithful to a job than we are to our heavenly father, the one who saved us. That paycheck that they give us, they take half of the money out anyways. And, uh, and you know, a lot of times our employers don't even take really good care of us, like they underpay us, all that. But we'll do more for our employer than we will do for our savior. Why is that? We're so earthly minded. Where is our heavenly minded attitude that we have? (laughs) And uh, I'm a mess today. You pray for me. But listen to this right here. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do both of them at the same time. You're either putting God first or you're putting your earthly needs first. You're either putting your family first or you're putting God first. Hey, guess what, church? You should love God more than your wife or your kids, yeah? Because if you, love that, if you love God like you should, then you'll love your wife, your kids, your family as you should. But God should always come first. But so many times people put their family in front of God and then they end up ruining their family because God didn't come first. And you say, how do you know? Because I've seen it happen over and over again. Ask pastor, ask, ask Brother Joe Mazdonna who've been in the ministry for years now. Put God first. You won't regret it. Your family won't regret it. Pastor Frost, all that time, going on vacation up to Maine and stuff like that before my grandmother got saved, they would ask, you're here for such a short time. Why do you have to spend Sunday going to church? Why, why are you doing that? Why? Because I love God. Because, God. because I'm putting God first, Mom. All that time, he, stood, he took a stand. He lived for God. He put God first. He put God above family. Put God above job. Why, why do you think I'm behind this pulpit right now? <laughs> He put God first. If he had put a job first, he's a, if you haven't met pastor, he's a very talented man. He could, he could, he's weirdly brilliant with everything. He can fix car. He can do plumbing. He, he, this church has pretty much been pastor for us. Amen. He's done most of it. He, he's helping Brother Mario over here doing the first. He's never really done that before. He was working at a chocolate factory as a, an engineer, those, keeping those massive machines running on a pastor theology degree. He's never gone to, he's never gone to school for uh, engineering. 
But he, so to talk about him being talented is an understatement. He, had, he could have been making a lot of money, but instead he put God first. And my, my sister, who's serving as a pastor's wife out in, in uh, Delaware, and me serving as an assistant pastor to Pastor Frost here at Solid Rock, there's one reason for that. It's really, I mean, of course, I'm responsible for my own decisions. Y- your kids are also responsible. But guess what? They're likely to have a lot more success when you decide, God, you are first. You come above family. You come above my job. Just try it a little bit, and you will just see what God can do. Why, why do you think my grandmother saved after all these years? Because pastor decided I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to serve mammon. I'm going to serve God, because I can't do both. Church, give it to God. Hold fast. Stand strong. And if you're not holding fast yet, draw nigh to God. Get there. Hold fast, and let God use you so mightily. He wants to. He so wants to. Look at James 1.8. Finish up with this point, and then we're going to the last point, and we'll be done. James 1.8, James, James 1.8. I know I haven't been real preaching, but more teaching today, but I hope it's helping you just a little bit. James 1.8, and I know a lot of this can be very familiar, but it needs to be said. James 1.8, we need to be, <laughs> just like your kid needs to be told over and over again about, you can't do this, Johnny. You can't do this, Johnny. You, how many, you have to repeat it with your kids. We're the same way, though. We need to be told the same thing over and over and over and over. Oh, man, that preacher's preaching on it again. Because you obviously still haven't learned it, amen. Like, we're never going to quite learn it because we're human beings. We make mistakes. We need to be reminded. I am faithful to church. Well, guess what? I'm going to keep on punching it in right there because I want you to be faithful. I'm ram reading my Bible. Well, we're going to keep pushing it because I want to keep reminding you, keep encouraging you, keep exhorting you. Church, there's a reason why it's pushed over and over again because the devil wants to slip you up from it. The basics of Christianity, it's super basic, the basic being faithful to church, reading your Bible, praying. But without those, you're never going to be right with God. That's why it gets hammered at the church over and over and over again. That's why it gets hammered. Look at James, James, uh, um, let me find where that's at. Uh, James 1.8, James 1.8. Uh, look at this right here. James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his what? Ways. Again, you can tr- trying, to, trying to serve God and then serve your family, your job, anything like that, you're going to be an absolute mess if you try to do that. If, you try to, if you're constantly compromising and trying to juggle, just like trying to work two full-time jobs, amen? Um, or me trying to work. Uh, all right, so I did work third shift. And uh, I worked third shift at a job and going to college. Trust me, one of them was suffering. <laughs> it was the school work, all right? School work was suffering. Because it's really hard to juggle two things without putting one priority, right? Putting one as the priority. And that's the same with this as well. You're going to be so unstable as a Christian if you keep trying to go back and forth, go back and forth, back and forth. It's going to make you unstable. It's going to make your family unstable as well. Because no man liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. Church, you impact others around you. I don't care if you don't have kids. I don't care if your kids are growing up. You got grandkids. Or it doesn't matter who. If you got people, that, just friends in general, you influence people. You influence people. Hold fast. Draw nigh. Hold fast. Be unmovable. How can we hold fast? It's easy to praise Jesus and talk about him when things are going well. Easy to praise, and praise God and talk about him in church. But what about outside the church? And what about when things aren't going well? And I just think about that foolish and wise man. The foolish man builds his house on the sand, builds his house on his job, builds his house, builds his life on his job, builds his life on his family, builds his life on everything that can fall apart so easily. But then there's the wise man that builds his house on the what? Who is? Jesus. And when you put him first and that storm comes and that trouble comes and that trial comes, you're not playing catch up trying to build a rock underneath your house now. You know, all right, Lord, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you underneath now so I don't go all over the place. No, you've already, you, it's already taken care of. So when that storm hits you like a hurricane, that you're unmovable because it's not up to you, it's up to him. Lastly, three, and we're done. We're so done. Three, let us consider one another. Go to, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. When I draw an eye to God, and I hold fast. To hold fast, I, sometimes, I need, hold fast. To draw nigh to God and hold fast, number one, I need God's help. And I need people's help as well. I need fellow believers' help as well. This is what, when the importance of the house of God comes so strongly. When people, yeah, well, let's look at this right here. Uh, go to, go to uh, verse 24, uh, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, verse 24. 
Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure, pure water. They get close to God, got to be free of sin. 23, once we're close to God and we have that relationship with God, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Stand strong in your testimony. Don't waver. People are watching you. People are looking up to you without wavering for he is faithful that promise. And lastly, 24, and let us put, consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And let us consider one another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. We looked at Paul too. We looked at Paul. Paul went into Damascus with a certain group of friends, right? Him and his buddies planning on murdering everyone. <laughs> and he <coughs> planning on murdering some Christians. When he got saved, did he stay with that same group of friends? No. He found himself a new group of friends. And they actually ended up saving his life, helped him get down by a basket over the wall after he you know, went to the synagogue and started preaching Jesus. They wanted to do what to him? Kill him. So his new group of friends saved his life, amen. Pays to have new friends. All right. But look at this right here. Paul and his, friend, Paul and his friends changed after his conversion. Have your friends changed since you have been saved? What kind of friends do you have? You should look around you right now. These should be your new friends, amen, your new family. People that have similar interests become friends. You know, I go to work and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's very hard to have any type of friends in work because my life is so different. I don't smoke, I don't drink. Uh, I, don't, I don't do all the, a lot of the, the vile stuff that they talk about. I don't cuss. So it's very hard. So it should bother you a little bit if you're able to make, and now nah, again, I'm not saying that you can't have a, a good relationship with people because you need to have a good relationship with your coworkers. But there should not be this, instant desire to have close friends that are not children of God because they will drag you down every time, every time. Unsaved people will drag you down. Similar interests, people that have similar interests becomes friends. Well, I'm gonna be a good influence on them, but what about them? Are they gonna be a bad influence on you? And it may even be something minor, but we have to be so, the devil is looking for any chink in our armor to take us out, any chink. Well, this sounds extreme. Christianity is extreme. I hope you didn't, hopefully you realize that by now. All right? Now, we're not living in some little cult building, you know, we're all living in the same place together, okay? All right? It's not a cult here. But Christian, you, you got to be so very careful because the devil, he's constantly circling. He's constantly looking for a weakness. We should have the right kind of friends, right kind of friends. You know, good friends will call other friends out when they stray into sin. David and Nathan. And actually, David was a pastor too, but Nathan was a good friend of David. When David sinned with Bathsheba and killed Bathsheba's husband, the king of Israel did it. So the king usually had pretty, pretty free hand with what he was able to do. And anybody that could, you know, rebuked him could face instant death. But what did Nathan do? Even though it was unpopular, unsafe, scary, a good friend came and told David exactly what he had done wrong and the judgment that was gonna come on upon him. And what did David do? He got right Hey, church, sometimes when you're seeing your friends slack off, stray away, it's not good just to, you know, they're walking toward that cliff, you know, with a blindfold on. It's, it's probably good for you to grab them and stop them, amen, before they go off the cliff and kill themselves, amen. The same could be friend of, as well as friends, Christian friends that are straying into sin. And then also friends will encourage each other in difficult times. I think of Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas in prison together. And what are they doing? Praising God, lifting each other's spirit up. I think of Moses Moses, the rod was falling down. He was struggling. And Aaron and Hur came and lifted his hands up and helped him. And the Israelites were victorious that day. Why? Because a couple men came and helped him out. And church, you should have, your friends should be in this place right here. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a scary thing when people are in right before service starts and then they're out as soon as service is over. How can you fellowship? How can you connect? How can, how can you communicate with your fellow believers and stuff and, and talk about what's going on in your life? Hey, I need, a, I need prayer for this. We should be asking prayer for each other all the time. We should be constantly talking about each other's lives and how, how, how we can exhort. Look at this right here. And let us consider one, to an, uh, one another to provoke unto love and to what? Unto love and to good, good works. Not what church? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And we're seeing that more and more. More and more services and churches are getting canceled. More and more people are just falling out, falling out. And they're just going astray. And you, you, every time, you, you, 
you can't lie to me and say that you're right with God when you're not in the house of God because it's impossible. It's impossible to be right with God when you're disobeying the word of God. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, encouraging, uh, uh, rebuking, approving one another so much the more as ye see the day approaching. As ye see the day approaching. And uh, let me finish. We're just about done. Well, let me go over here. All right, brother. Uh, hold on. All right. So you got, you got the rope right here. And then right here, brother uh, Joe. Miss Donna, go ahead and you grab part two. All right, so I wasn't moved, trying to move Jeff either. I'm not going to try to hurt you guys either. Pastor Pinto was like, ah. Oh. All right, but now the devil, when he's going up against you, he's not just going up against Brother Jeff when he's attacking and he's trying to shake you, make you waver, but he's going up against Brother Jeff and his two prayer partners right here, Miss Donna and Brother Joe right there. If you think about that right there, why is the... Why is the church such an important thing? Because we're a body of believers that need each other. Amen. If you don't have each other, you're going to go find it somewhere else. You're going to go find companionship, fellowship somewhere else. And it's, if it's not in the church, it's almost always wrong because I'm telling you this right here, how can, how can two agree if they walk not, how can two walk together if they not agree? And right, there, that thing right there, how can a saved man have a friendship and talk about his desire to serve the Lord with a lost man? How can you? You can't. I, I talk about the Lord in, in all state. They don't have a clue what I'm talking about. When I talk about vacation Bible school or what the Lord's done at our church, they don't have a clue. And you've you got to be careful of this with uh, um, uh, uh, compromising Christians as well. Christians that, you know, well, you know, you can be saved by this way or that. And Jesus is love. God loves everyone. If he loves everyone, why is he sending people to hell? right there think about that right there how can god love someone but then send them to hell god god loves his children that are saved amen god loves his children that are saved now does he want the lost to come to repentance and be yes he does but how can we have fellowship with an unbeliever and expect to grow as a christian we can't it's going to be something that drag it's going to be a weight on us that will drag us down every time church this is your family this is your friends even my weird self is your friend amen <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, you know me for long enough. You know I'm an oddball, all right? <laughs> but hey, oddballs make great youth pastors. <laughs> uh, but this is where you're going to get encouraged. This is where you're going to get up, rebuked, approved, exhorted to do more for Christ, to stand firm. I can't tell you how many times, and we can all say it right here, where we've started to go astray, we started to slip, and we may not like it, but pastor or somebody has called us out for it called us out for it, and we can all testify. You've been in this church at all, at all. Pastor's going pastor's gonna to go after you. He's going to rebuke you. You should be thankful for that. Yeah. That means he loves you, just like if your church people come here. Now, I'm not saying Ms. Donna should get up and say, Miss Karen, I've been seeing what you've been doing lately. All right? no, 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 no. Don't refuse to go, but all right? But hey, we should be a help and a blessing to those around us and, and encouraging each other to live for God. These are the kind of friends we need to have. These are the kind of friends we need to have. And, if, and we got the entire church holding on to that rope. And Brother Jeff is getting attacked, amen. And the devil comes. And he, but he's got an entire prayer warrior group all the way around him. And you think the devil's going to have as much success with Jeff if the entire church is praying with him as well? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let us, let us draw nigh. Church, if you're not close to God right now, it's because of one thing. You don't want to. It's because of sin in your life that you don't want to give up. Why would you want, not want to have a relationship with your heavenly father? Get rid of the sin. And with that relationship, if you do have a relationship with God right now, and you got a testimony, and you're, 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 you're being a testimony to the lost and dying world and to your family, hold fast. Stay strong, because the devil's going to keep attacking. Keep attacking. Keep attacking. Hold fast. And then lastly, right here, hold fast, and then Huh? Consider. Yes, consider. Well, let us consider one another. Amen. Get around the body of believers. Get around. Hey, this should be your family right here. This should be your friends right here. And I, I want to emphasize this too again, right here. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Who are you putting first in your life, God or yourself? Because you're going to suffer because of it. Your family's going to suffer. And then you're going to be in heaven and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna feel... You're going to feel sorrow there as well, endless sorrow. And I think we'll all feel a little sorrow. I really do, because we'll wish we had given him more. But it's going to be a lot different for those that just 
serve mammon instead of God, for sure. Hope this message was a help to you. Let's pray. The uh, piano player is going to come. And if you're not saved, you can't try night at God if you're not saved. You can't have a relationship with the Lord if you're not saved.